Thank you. So I'm going to talk to you about the regulation of internet companies and just kind of give you a feeling of the down in the life of what I do. I run France Limited, which is an ASX listed uh, company, which consists or uh, consists of five uh, subsidiaries. Uh, many of you have probably heard of freelance.com. That's a global marketplace for jobs. We have 33 million people around the world who uh, can get any sort of job done you can possibly think of. 15 million jobs have gone through. I can see that the, um, the theme has come off the slides for some reason, but anyway, we'll persist. Um, you know, we've done over $4.5 billion worth of jobs post on the website and so on. Um, anything, you know, from copywriting, building a website, design for me, a mobile app, through to astrophysics, aerospace engineering, genetic engineering, biotechnology, you name it, you can do it on that, on Freelancer. Uh, and we work from consumers, from $10 projects, can be outsourced on a, on a website and get people from emerging markets or anywhere in the world to do it for you, right through to NASA or Airbus. And uh, here's an example of kind of where we operate. So we operate pretty much everywhere in the world. The white dots are where our users are, the pink are where people are posting jobs, the blue are where the jobs are being performed. And when you zoom in, we have people pretty much everywhere. There's electricity and there's internet. So it's just an internet company. I mean, the great thing about a website is you throw it up and people anywhere in the world can access. And so you can basically um, you know, operate everywhere pretty, pretty quickly. So um, it's an example of the sorts of things people get designed and then the sorts of people uh, working on the site. And I'll skip through, obviously there's 34 languages and 39 currencies as a result of that. And these are the sorts of things people get done. So this is NASA. Um, the other company we've got, in the other big company we've got in the web and the business is a company called escrow.com. That's been around for 20 years. Um, started by Fidelity in 1999. It's a payment system. You can think of it like PayPal, but it's for buying and selling anything that's expensive. So boats, cars, airplanes, jewelry, gemstones, diamonds, zebras, surrogacy agreements in the US, 20,000 tons of alfalfa from China to, to uh, the US, whatever, whatever it may be. <laughs> Again, another global business, and you know, we used to buy and sell Shopify stores, airplanes, and tickets to the space station Aurora, which might be going up in 2021 if they get off the ground. It's $10 million a seat, deposits accepted now. And we have a third business, which is a freight business, and this is basically, you can think of it like freelancer, but you can move things around. It's primarily mining, construction, uh, industrial sort of stuff. We have 7,000 transport operators in that marketplace. So now I thought I'd give you a sort of feeling of what it's like to run these businesses. So these are just websites, right? Um, we operate obviously in a whole bunch of different countries, uh, 34 languages, 39 currencies, in 45 currencies out. That's pretty complex in itself, but only if it was that simple. We also have users everywhere, including the Vatican and Antarctica. So let's take something as simple as starting as, as taking a payment from a customer. I mean, the big picture here is that we're in a global trade war in, between three parties, the US, Europe and China. Apple was fined 13 billion euros in Ireland, therefore Deutsche Bank gets fined $9 billion, and so on and so forth from the US. Now, at the same time, the growth that's happening is mainly in US technology companies, so the EU decides it's going to go to war on technology companies and starts off with charging a value-added tax or VAT on digital services. Now, VAT's only payable by consumers, not by businesses, but the criteria you need to assess whether someone is a business or a consumer isn't clear-cut. There's a lot of ambiguity and it's quite subjective. For example, looking for customer business repeats and whether or not they have a website. Now, of course, there's 28 jurisdictions in Europe and it's based on the country where the item is purchased, which you have to determine through two pieces of non-conflicting evidence, such as a billing address and matching IP address, which you'll need to keep for 10 years. Now, that wouldn't be a problem if you had a union, say, of European states with a central government and standardised rules. But of course, it's the European Union and there are 28 different VAT jurisdictions and the rates are all completely different. In Luxembourg, it's 17%, Malta, it's 18%, Germany, it's 19%, France, it's 20%, Belgium, 21%, Italy, 22%. I think they just to just piss you off. Ireland is 23%, Finland is 24%, Denmark is 25%, and Hungary is 27%. This can pose a bit of a problem if a German is traveling on a train to France through Belgium and you have to figure out where the, where the item is actually being purchased. Nevertheless, they do have a one-stop shop called Moss and you can follow these things quarterly in one place. Now, of course, we operate in Australia and we also have to collect 10% GST in Australia. We do that in our actual fees in the marketplace. In India, it's called TCS, or tax con at, uh, uh, collected at source, and that's 1% of the gross payments to freelancers, and, uh, and rather than the fees we charge. Now, the tax returns we have to file there are filed in every state. There are 29 states and seven territories, and unlike the EU, there is no one-stop shop, and so we have to file, file tax returns in every state individually and on a monthly basis, 36 states every single month. Now in the UK, and since 2018 in the UK, it's illegal to surcharge for credit cards, even though there's a real underlying cost. 
In Australia, you can, but since 2016, it can't be more than what it costs the business to process the payment. The problem is that when you go to a payment gateway like WorldPay or Adyen or Global Collect, they give you a matrix of hundreds of numbers as to the cost to process an American Express card from an American versus a Visa card versus a Platinum card. It also depends on the currency, country, and so on and so forth. Now, the EU wasn't, going, wasn't done in going after technology, and last year they introduced the uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which squarely aimed at Facebook and Google. And has been described as a cumbersome, punitive, unprecedented extraterritorial ter legal regime that hijacks the resources of business everywhere without actually delivering privacy protection commensurate with the enormous toll attempts uh, to comply with it extract. The GDPR includes the right to be forgotten, so consumers can ask for their details to be permanently deleted from your database. Of course, that immediately conflicts with the Code for Financial Regulation 103.33 in the United States, which requires you to keep identity documents for five years if someone makes a payment, and the mandatory requirement of companies to keep financial records for seven years in many jurisdictions for tax purposes. Fines can reach 4% of global turnover, or 20 million euros, where it's ever greater. Most consumers in the EU would practically notice this change because every single website in the world now is forced to spam them with an update to their privacy policy, and their web browsing speeds have halved due to having to click through all these pop-ups every time you browse a website. It's ridiculous, I was in London recently, and every time you browse now you have to click through a, like a pop-up before you can actually use the website. Um, this spring is actually a joke that two businesses walk into a bar, one says to the other, do you know a good GDPR consultant? And the other said, yes. Can you pass me their email address? No. <laughs> Some companies have res responded, no joke, by banning Europeans altogether from their websites. Not to be outdone by the Europeans, the sovereign nation of California, which undoubtedly boasts of some of the most progressive and innovative people of the United States, curiously ruled by a government that hates progress and innovation, and frankly the rest of the United States, has legislated the California Consumer Privacy Act, which really puts the boot in the advertising support of business models of Google and Facebook and extends the GDPR to set up rules to allow consumers to opt out of the sale of their personal information and have equal service and price, whether or not they choose to exercise their privacy rights. The problem with this is the jurisdiction of the law is California, and we can look forward to the same but slightly different rules for residents of Texas, Massachusetts, and Kansas. But wait, there's more. We operate a marketplace in the EU. It's now introduced new regulation on fairness and transparency in online platform uh, trading. This requires marketplaces and search engines now to disclose the main parameters, basically the secret source, on how you rank goods and services on your website. So when you do a Google search listing, Google has to tell you why someone ranked at number one or number two. Uh, to help sellers understand how to optimize their presence. Basically, um, there's even talk by European MPs now that they want an, um, the algorithm used by um, our platforms, you know, whether it's Google, Facebook, or Freelancer, to be escrowed with the regulator. Now some companies not only have to um, provide the marketplace, but they're also, some companies not only provide the marketplace, but will have, uh, also sell in the marketplace at the same time. According to the new rules, uh, platforms must exhaustively disclose any advantage they give to their own products over others. This may be, seem harsh, but in February of this year, India outright banned marketplaces like Amazon from offering exclusively its own brand goods and from selling goods from merchants who are considered investors. This is like Woolworths being banned from selling home brand. So in the last couple of months, Amazon destocked over 400,000 products in India. And if Audi was to start selling online in India, probably the only products left would be Vegemite and Milo. Um, where are we? Here we are. Now, we're not done with taking a payment from a customer yet. The EU has also introduced a second payment services directive, or PSD2, which introduces major changes that significantly impact um, marketplace services. In a typical marketplace setup, the platform acts as an intermediary for buyer and the seller, right? Um, where the payment is actually made to the platform and the platform then pays the seller. The platform can no longer receive payments owned, um, owed by buyers to sellers. If it does, you have to obtain, obtain a payments license from the regulator to become a regulated business. I predicted this was coming, and in 2015, I acquired escrow.com, which is a payments business as the world's largest online escrow provider. It's a US business, uh, payments business, otherwise known as money transmission. And of course, money transmission in the US is licensed state by state in the United States. There are 50 states in the US, four states do not require licenses, there are six territories, so you need 52 licenses to operate in the United States. We have 46, and for each we have to submit several license applications. I have to provide a balance sheet of my assets, fingerprints, palm prints, I didn't know this existed, arm prints, so if I ever become a cat burglar in Nevada and lean against the wall, they've got my arm print. 
uh, and a criminal and background check. Some states will take electronic fingerprinting. Some will most actually require it to be ink on cards. Some will take the FBI stock card. Some require their own state stock card. And some require you go to the US to be fingerprinted. Many of the states require financial bonds to be set up, sometimes in the millions of dollars, and we have to manage all of those bonds. I was lucky I bought the business because in 2018 also, the California Department of Business Oversight, which hates technology, has decided that services marketplaces making payments now do need licensing in California as an escrow provider. And even Airbnb has now been hit. And there's a video on Twitter that came up from Brian Chesky where he was told by Doug Leone, the famous VC, you have the worst job in the world because not only you're a tech business, but you operate in all these countries and so forth, and now you need to get a, a payments license. Now, California requires a person sitting on a chair to approve payments going in and out. So we have an office in California where the person sits on a chair to improve payments going in and out, and we've had $5.5 billion worth of payments go through. So you can imagine in an automated world uh, what that's like. Most states do not allow you to collect interest on the money that you hold uh, uh, and the customers, except Arizona, of course. So Arizona has to let you offer to the customer to get interest on the money that you hold uh, in the bank and pay it out, even though you don't collect it, and it's illegal for you to collect it. Washington requires you to keep the money in a separate trust account. And that's only the US. The UK Payments Institution license requires independent financial management to be based in the UK. It also passports across the UK, well it did before Brexit, and after Brexit we don't really know. To get an AFSL in Australia, you have to have responsible managers appointed, we have an AFSL now, but you'll only accept you as a responsible manager if you've been a responsible manager at another licensed firm, Catch-22. As a payments business, you have to file suspicious activity reports and identify your customers. In the US, to identify your customers, you must follow CFR 103.33F, which requires you to collect identification for anyone making a payment over $3,000 or more, where you have to examine a document, preferably one that contains a person's name, address, this is actually the regulation, it says preferably one that contains the person's name, address and photograph that would be normally acceptable by a financial institution as a means of identification when cashing checks for persons other than established customers, whatever the hell that means. I literally have looked through all the regulation in the US around identity checking, and this is the regulation. Preferably, you have a photo ID front and back that you can use to cash a check. It doesn't say driver's license, doesn't say passport. So what do you collect? Well, practically, this means we have to be experts in collecting ID, and we are. One of my biggest teams in the company is uh, about 80 staff, is a 24 by seven compliance and anti-money laundering verification team, and we have learned how to detect a forgery in an Indian identity card, what the background looks in a New York uh, a driver's license photo and what the visa is policy is country by country. In Australia as a payments business or reporting entity, you have to do all of this for any amount over zero dollars, according to Austrac. Generally laws in different countries completely conflict. So if someone in Australia pays someone in the US some money, uh, some money, we have to figure out which law trumps which other law and is because it, it's impossible, for example, for money to be physically in two different accounts at the same time. On top of this, we have to match the name against a variety of other sanction lists, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, negative news searches and so on. And in 2018, it really doesn't help if your first name is Muhammad, if you want to function in the world. Unfortunately for Bangladesh, for Bangladesh, 45% of the population have the first name Muhammad. And we are in the top 20 websites in Bangladesh. That isn't even scraping the surface of the issues with trust and safety, and that's just taking a payment. We haven't gotten into the labor laws and how they work in the online context, worker classification laws, or someone working for you is whether they're deemed an employee of a contractor. This drove Fedora out of Australia. The US Supreme Court recently shifted how it views relationships to an ABC test. A, the worker is free from control in the direction of the hire in relation to the performance of the work and under the contract in fact. And B, the worker performs the work that's outside the usual course of the hire's business. And C, the worker is customarily engaged in an independent established trade, occupation and business of the same nature of the work performed for the hire. So basically, it's very, very gray. And we have to figure out for all these people working for NASA and Airbus and so forth, are they employees or are they contractors? The upside for all of this, I think, is in the future, at least in my interpretation of the laws, is that Fedora and Uber may have to be forced to hire their staff off freelancer.com, which might be a good thing for me. Consumer complaints and how dispute resolution and arbitration occurs have a different process country by country. We have to deal with that too. And I mentioned also we also operate a global freight business. And as you can imagine, there's its own set of licensing rules that differ state by state and country by country. And we just got our US license issued by the Department of Transport. All these licenses required you to be incorporated in country. So we've set up companies all over the world and file financial accounts and tax returns very regularly. And I won't get into the rules around foreign ownership of those companies jurisdiction by jurisdiction. And also you have the, the Foreign Controlled uh, Corporations um, Act um, uh, in Australia, which means you have to have independent management of sound in mind, otherwise you get double taxation. So you've got to set all these companies everywhere, they're gonna hire a superfluous management team everywhere. 
This week, my team had to fill in forms to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, which are mandatory on how much money is spent in various things, how many shareholders we have, and so forth. Once a year, the Workplace Gender Equity uh, Equality Agency requires us to fill in a form detailing how many people with various sexual organs are employed in various positions, and I'm sure by next year, the Blue Eye, Brown Eye Equality Agency and the Fat People, Thin People Agency and the Tall People, Short People Agency will also require their forms to be filled in too. This may not be all bad if the systems for lodging these forms weren't paper-based, Microsoft Word and archaic systems developed in the Pleistocene area, epoch. Most of these sites require you to only use Internet Explorer to log in, even though the market share of Internet Explorer is 9.5% today and dropping like a rock. And in the United States, the National Multi-State Licensing System and Registry, uh, Registry website, which we have to log into all the time, uh, which 64 regulatory agencies use for issuing licenses in the money services business, debt and consumer finance industries, is only turned on from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., except on Saturdays when it's turned on from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. This is a website. Except the third Saturday of each calendar month, where it only has limited availability, I presume because the laptop used in the host of the website is taken home by the office manager to play computer games. <laughs> I, could only go, I could go on for a few more hours and days, but I'll leave it at that. I've got plenty of material. I'll save it for when I write the sequel to Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Thank you. <laughs>